This is lecture 3H, and today we're going to talk about solubility. Solubility is defined as the maximum amount of solute that will dissolve in a specific amount of solvent. When you've actually completely dissolved as much solute as you can in a particular amount of solvent, you have created what's called a saturated solution. That's a solution that contains as much dissolved solute as possible. This happens sometimes when you're trying to put sugar into iced tea. You take a couple of teaspoons of sugar, you stir it up into the iced tea, and after a while you look and see, wow, there's still some sugar sitting at the bottom of that container, and you stir it some more and stir it some more, and it doesn't all disappear. Well, why not? Because you've actually reached the maximum amount of sugar that can dissolve, which is actually less than the two teaspoons you put in there, and so you have some of the excess sugar, which is unable to dissolve, sitting at the bottom. So how do you reach a saturated solution? Well, if you take your two teaspoons of sugar and you dump it into the bottom of your iced tea, what's going to happen is the water molecules are going to come up with the sugar molecules, they're going to hydrogen bond to it, and they're going to start pulling those sugar molecules into the solution. That process is called dissolving. I'm going to represent the rate of dissolving by an upward pointing arrow, the length representing how fast the dissolving is taking place. So maybe you dissolve three molecules per second, so after one second, there'll be three dissolved sugar molecules in this iced tea. Now, as those dissolved sugar molecules float around in the solution, they might crash back down onto the pile of sugar at the bottom and get recaptured. That process is called crystallization. And so with a small number of dissolved sugar molecules, you're gonna have a small crystallization rate initially. The rate of crystallization is gonna be proportional to how many dissolved sugar molecules there are. So if you have dissolving happening faster than crystallizing, you're going to start building up more and more dissolved sugar into the solution. But then as the dissolved sugar builds up, you increase the probability of a dissolved sugar molecule hitting the lump of sugar at the bottom. That increases the crystallization rate. As long as the dissolving rate is still greater than the crystallization rate, you're going to continue to dissolve that solute. So more and more sugar is going to dissolve. But at some point, you're going to reach a situation where there's so much dissolved sugar that the rate of crystallizing exactly equals the rate of dissolving. This is what happens in your iced tea when you dump two teaspoons of sugar in there. You stir and stir and stir and there's still a little lump at the bottom. Well, how come all that sugar didn't disappear? It's because the sugar is still dissolving, but it's dissolving at the exact same rate that it's crystallizing. And whenever this has happened, whenever you have a saturated solution, you have reached what's called solution equilibrium. And that's when the rates of dissolving and crystallizing are equal. So any saturated solution you create is always in solution equilibrium. Now, <clears throat> what if you wanted to dissolve more sugar into the tea? What would you do? Well, we do know that if you warm up the tea and you make it hot tea instead of iced tea, you can dissolve a whole lot more sugar in there. So there are several different factors that affect the solubility of a particular solute, and the most important one is temperature. Almost always, if you increase the temperature, you're going to increase the rate of dissolving so much that by the time you reach an equilibrium, you will have a large amount of solute in the dissolved state. So increasing the temperature almost always increases a solid's solubility. There are some strange exceptions, but they're few and far between. Something like ytterbium-3 sulfate dissolves better in cold water than hot water for some strange reason. But most things, you raise the temperature, solubility will increase if we're talking about solid solutes. Now, if you're talking about gaseous solutes, it's 100% the other way around. If you increase the temperature and you have a gas dissolved in water, you decrease the gaseous solubility. If you have a really cold Coke and you pop the lid open, there's a lot of carbonation in there, a lot of dissolved carbon dioxide. If you drink it, it really tickles your nose, right? But if you sit it out on the counter for an hour and it warms up to room temperature and then you drink it and you go, wow, this tastes flat. That's because at a warmer temperature, the dissolved carbon dioxide has escaped and it's no longer in the solution anymore. So temperature and a gaseous solubility are inversely related. Sometimes the pressure can have an effect on solubility. It actually has no effect on a solid's solubility, but it does have an effect on a gas's solubility. If you increase the pressure of a particular gas as it's in contact with a liquid, you will increase that gas's solubility. 
There's a mathematical relationship for this. It's actually used a lot in mechanical engineering for people to do fluid dynamics and deal with uh, solutions and gases. It's called Henry's Law. And Henry's Law states the amount of gas dissolved in a liquid is directly proportional to the pressure of that gas that's in contact with the liquid. So you may see this if you're an engineering major. You want to know what is the concentration of a gas dissolved in a liquid. That would be C in this equation. Well, whatever the pressure of the gas is being exposed to the surface of the liquid, that will be proportional to the concentration of the dissolved gas. This is how you can get a lot of carbon dioxide dissolved in Coke. You put these cans of Coke under high pressure. And what pressure are you putting in there? You're not putting air in there. That would just make more nitrogen and oxygen dissolve. You fill those cans with carbon dioxide. So you have such a high pressure of carbon dioxide inside the can, it causes more of the carbon dioxide to dissolve. And when you have more dissolved carbon dioxide, we know it tickles your nose more when you drink it, and then you buy it over and over again. So Coca-Cola and Pepsi, you wanna make sure that you keep getting your nose tickled. So they put a lot of CO2 into those cans, maybe five or 10 atmospheres worth to keep as much carbon dioxide dissolved as possible so that it'll stay carbonated when you drink. Now, what we're gonna do for the rest of this period is we're gonna talk about how do we measure how much solute is dissolved in a particular solution. So we're gonna learn four different concentration units. There's actually way more. You could have an infinite number of possible concentration units, but I'm gonna show you the four most common used in chemistry. The first one is mass percent. And this is simply a fraction. It's the mass of the solute divided by the mass of the solution. And then if you wanna make it a percent, you multiply by 100. So to write this out in more mathematical terms, the mass percent is a fraction. It's the mass of your solute divided by the mass of the solution. So it's telling you what fraction of the solution is made up of solvent. And then anytime you have a fraction, if you ever multiply by 100, you get a percent. If you multiply by 1,000, you get parts per 1,000. If you multiply by a million, you get parts per million. So you could actually say a percent is really parts per hundred is another way to say that. Let's do an example. Let's find the mass percent of KCl in a solution made with 20.0 grams of KCl dissolved in 80.0 grams of H2O. Now it's an easy calculation, but it also leads to one of the most common mistakes made in concentration units. A lot of people will take these numbers and go 20 divided by 80 times 100 is 25%. And this solution is not 25% KCl because you did not go mass of the solute divided by mass of the solution. You did mass of the solute divided by mass of the solvent. So you have to remember the solution is the combination of the solvent and the solute. You have to add the 80 and 20 together to get the proper mass of the solution. So the actual mass percent of the solution is 20 grams of KCl divided by a total of 100 grams of solution that comes out to be a fraction of 0 0.200. And then if you multiply by 100, you'll get 20.0%. So as long as you don't make that one simple error, mass percent is actually a really easy concentration unit to deal with. But it's actually not that convenient for chemists because chemists look at chemical reactions. Chemical reactions occur on a molecule to molecule basis. And we need to know how many molecules there are in a particular sample so we can do quantitative work with their chemical reactions. So we need something that's proportional to the number of molecules and something that's proportional to how many molecules there are in a sample is moles. And so we actually come up with a fraction that's called a mole fraction, where it's just the moles of solute per moles of the entire solution. The abbreviation for mole fraction is the Greek letter chi, and it fortunately looks like an X, so you can just make an X if you want, but it's actually the Greek letter chi. And so we're going to do an example of this. If it's done very similarly to mass percent, it's just you need to know the moles of the two components now. So we're going to try to find the mole fraction of KCl in the same solution from before that was 20.0 grams of KCl dissolved in 80.0 grams of water. So we just need the moles of the solute, KCl, divided by the moles of the total solution, which will be the moles of KCl plus the moles of water. So this is a little bit more challenging because you have to do a conversion. You have to convert the mass of each of these substances into moles, and we do this with molar masses found on the periodic table. You need the molar mass of KCl to convert 20 grams of KCl into moles of KCl. And you get the molar mass of KCl by looking on the periodic table. One formula unit of KCl, or one mole of KCl actually, 
has one mole of potassium in it. So the periodic table tells you one mole of potassium weighs 39.10 grams. One mole of KCl has one mole of chlorine in it. And from the periodic table, one mole of chlorine is 35.45 grams. Add those together, that turns out to be 74.55 grams. That means 74.55 grams of KCl must be weighed out to have one mole of KCl. That's an equality. 74.55 grams of KCl equals one mole of KCl. If you write that as a fraction, that's a conversion factor. I'll put the 74.55 grams of KCl on the bottom. I'll put the mole of KCl on the top. The grams of KCl will cancel out. And to three significant figures, I get 0.268 and a guard digit three moles of KCl. If I'm doing the mole fraction, I need to know the moles of both components so I can add the moles of the two components together to get the moles of solution. So I'm going to do the same thing with the 80.0 grams of water. One mole of water has two moles of hydrogen, so I go two multiplied by 1.01 grams per mole for hydrogen. And there's one mole of oxygen, so I go one multiplied by 16.00 grams per mole for oxygen. That adds up to 18.02, which means you need to weigh out 18.02 grams of water to have one mole of water molecules. Writing this at a fraction, that becomes a conversion factor. And I put the grams on the bottom to cancel out. When they do, I'll calculate the number of moles of water in our sample, which is 4.44. So to get the mole fraction of the KCl, I'll take the moles of the KCl and I'll divide it by the total number of moles and when I do this, I'm going to wind up getting a three significant figure answer. Remember, in terms of significant figures, zeros that start a number do not count. So when you get 0, 0.0, that's not a significant figure. Five is the first significant figure. So this is a three significant figure number would be 0 0.0570. Now, mole fraction is exactly what it says. It's a fraction. We could have a mole percent if you want. All you would do is you would multiply your mole fraction by 100. That would come out 5.70%, and that would be a mole percent. But chemists only need to know mole fractions. The percents really aren't relevant, and we'll see this a little bit later in this particular unit. Okay. <clears throat> the third unit I want you to be familiar with is probably the most common unit in chemistry. It's called molarity, and it's abbreviated by a capital M. And it's defined as moles of solute per liter of solution. The reason this unit was invented was that it gave chemists a really easy way to calculate the number of moles of a dissolved solute because this is how many moles there are per liter of solution. The only measurement you have to make is the volume of the solution. And if you know the volume of the solution, to calculate the number of moles of solute is going to be really easy. We'll see that in an example coming up. So this is used to easily calculate moles of a solute by only measuring the volume of a solution. That's why in our chemistry lab, we have things that measure volumes really accurately, like volumetric flasks and pipettes and burettes. It's so that if we get the volume of a solution measured accurately, we can do a really simple calculation to calculate how many moles of solute there are. But before we do that, let's just go through an example calculation as to how you get the molarity of a solution. Writing what's written in words at the top algebraically, capital M, which stands for molarity, is going to equal the moles of the solute per the liters of the solution. Now, moles and liters are units. They're units for particular quantities. The two quantities there are uh, units for are N, quantity of matter, that'll be measured in moles, and V is for volume, and we're going to measure that in terms of liters. So if you can calculate the quantity of matter of a dissolved solute in moles and calculate the volume of the solution in liters, all you do is divide them, and that ratio is what we call the molarity. So let's do an example. Let's find the molarity of a solution with 6.24 grams of magnesium chloride dissolved in enough water to make 500.0 milliliters of solution. So which is the solvent, which is the solute? In each of these situations, the major component's always the solvent, whatever there's more of. And it seems like we have a whole lot more water here because we're making 500 milliliters of solution and we only have 6.24 grams of magnesium chloride. So the magnesium chloride's the solute we need to calculate how many moles there are of that. So we're going to need to calculate the molar mass of magnesium chloride. So you go to the periodic table. Now, one mole of magnesium chloride has one mole of magnesium. So you go one multiplied by 24.30, or 31 actually. And then chlorine, there's two moles of chlorine in one mole of magnesium chloride. So you go two multiplied by 35.45. 
And if you add that together, that will give you the molar mass of magnesium chloride, which is 95.21 grams per mole. We arrange it as a fraction with the grams on the bottom to cancel out, and we'll have calculated the number of moles of magnesium chloride. Now, we don't need to calculate the number of moles of water. We just need to calculate the volume of the solution in liters. And quite often, they'll have measured the volume of the solution with one of these very accurate types of glass where we mentioned before. And they say the volume of the water is 500.0 milliliters. All you need to do is convert that into liters. And this we're going to do quite often. You can just do this in your head. All you have to do is move the decimal point three places to the left, because you're just dividing by 1,000 to switch milliliters into liters. So that'd be 0 0.5000 liters. So if you take your moles of magnesium chloride, divided by the 0 0.5000 liters, you will have moles of magnesium chloride per liter, and that's the definition of molarity. It's a three significant figure numerator divided by a four significant figure denominator, so the answer will be three significant figures, and I get 0 0.131. You can explicitly write the units as 0 0.131 moles of magnesium chloride per liter of solution, or if you want to abbreviate all that, you write a capital M, and it's read as molar, like the tooth. You would say 0 0.131 molar magnesium chloride. Okay. Now, when a dissolved solute happens to be elect an electrolyte, we know those solutes dissociate or ionize into separate ions. This magnesium chloride solution is actually going to contain a whole bunch of magnesium ions and a whole bunch of chloride ions. And I'm going to want you to be able to tell me what's the molarity of the magnesium ions in that solution and what's the molarity of the chloride ions in that solution. So electrolyte solutions really consist of individual ions, and it's really easy way to get the molarities of the individual ions if you know the molarity of the overall compound. All you have to do is look at the formula of the compound, in this case MgCl2, and notice hmm, it has one magnesium in its formula and two chlorides. So every one magnesium chloride that dissolves, you get one magnesium ion. If five of them dissolved, you get five magnesiums. If 100 dissolved, you get 100 magnesiums. So if 0 0.131 molar of magnesium chloride is in a solution, you would get 0 0.131 molar magnesium ions. All you have to do is take the molarity of the compound and multiply it by the number of ions of that particular ion in the formula. So if you take the molarity of the magnesium chloride, 0 0.131 molar, and multiply it by the one magnesium ion in the formula, that'll tell you the molarity of the magnesium ions that will be in that solution. Now, if you want to calculate the chloride concentration, how many chlorides are in the formula? There's two. So when one magnesium chloride dissolves in water, you always get two chlorides. If five magnesium chlorides dissolved in water, you'd get 10. If 100 magnesium chlorides dissolved in water, you'd get 200 chlorides. That's always twice the amount. So if you have 0 0.131 molar magnesium chloride, you're always going to have twice the amount of chloride. So you multiply 0 0.131 by the number of chlorides in the formula, which is two and that comes out 0.262 molar. If that makes sense, why don't you take a minute and see if you can tell me what would be the molarities of each ion in a 0 0.10 molar aluminum sulfate solution. You can pause this and then get your answers and then turn it back on and we'll tell you the answer. So the formula of this compound has two aluminums in it. You get two aluminums for each formula unit. So if the molarity of the compound is 0 0.10 molar, the aluminum concentration will just be 0 0.10 molar multiplied by 2, so the solution will be 0 0.20 molar in aluminum ions. There are three sulfates in the formula, so if you have 0 0.10 molar aluminum sulfate and there's three sulfates in the formula, you just multiply 0 0.10 by 3, and then the concentration of sulfate ions in this solution will be 0 0.30 molar. That's how you do it. Okay. Now, let's look and see why uh, molarity was actually invented and why it actually is so useful by doing one additional calculation involving molarity. I want us to find the mass of potassium nitrate needed to prepare 250 with a decimal point milliliters of a 0 0.200 molar potassium nitrate solution. Here's a calculation involving a solution that we know it's molarity, and we know the molarity is related to the moles of solute and the liters of solution. It's related through this expression here. It's just in this particular case, we're not solving for the molarity. We know the molarity. We know the volume. So there's one variable in this equation we don't know, and that's the quantity of matter n. 
So how would you solve for the number of moles, the quantity of matter, you would multiply both sides of the equation by V and look at this. This is the really simple way that chemists use to calculate the moles of a solute in a solution. If you know its molarity, all you have to do is measure its volume really accurately. And if you multiply molarity times volume, you have the number of moles of the solute. Okay, this is why molarity was invented. Now to do this calculation, I'm gonna multiply my molarity times volume, but you gotta watch the units. 0 0.200 capital M really isn't a unit. You actually have to write that out. 0 0.200 moles of potassium nitrate per liter of solution. And V has to be in liters, so we can't use the 250 milliliters. We have to move the decimal point three places over and use 0 0.250 liters. So when you do the dimensional analysis here in this simple calculation, I do not want to see you write 0 0.200 capital M because capital M is just an abbreviation. You actually need to write out what capital M stands for. It's moles of the particular solute, KNO3, per liter of solution. And now when you multiply by the volume, at least you can see, oh, I've got liters in the denominator, so I can't multiply by 250 milliliters. Switch the 250 milliliters into liters, and now they'll cancel out. And this is the really quick, simple operation that allows you to calculate moles of the solute. If you want to know how many grams of the potassium nitrate were needed, we haven't calculated that yet. We're going to have to do uh, one more conversion, and we're going to, have to switch moles of KNO3 into grams, and we do that with its molar mass. So you're going to look up the molar mass of one mole of potassium. You'll look up the molar mass of one mole of nitrogen. You'll look up the mass of three moles of oxygen. You'll add all that together. And that will be the molar mass of potassium nitrate, 101.11 grams per mole. So to make the units work out, you take your 0 0.0500 moles of KNO3 and you multiply it by the molar mass we just calculated, this time with the moles on the bottom to cancel out and the 101.11 grams on the top and the three significant figures. This is going to tell us you would need to weigh out 5.06 grams of potassium nitrate in order to make this solution. You would actually get a very accurate container, usually a volumetric flask that's 250 milliliters with one hairline on it. You would add the 5.06 grams of KNO3 to the volumetric flask, and you would add maybe 100 milliliters of water, and you would swirl it around till you all dissolved it. Once it's all dissolved, then, then you continue to add water until the water gets up to the hairline where the 250 milliliter mark is. You put a lid on it, you invert it 25 times or put it in a vortex mixer, to make sure it's homogeneous. And then you would have your 250 milliliters of a 0 0.200 molar potassium nitrate solution. One final concentration unit I want you to be aware of is the concentration unit called molality. It's abbreviated by an italicized lowercase m. And the reason it's in italics is that if you don't put it in italics, a lowercase m actually stands for mass in many equations that are used in physics. So we want to try to at least give it its own identity to some extent. Molality is the moles of solute per kilogram of solvent. So two unique things about this. First, it's still moles of solute, right? But it's per kilogram of the solvent. It's not of the solution. This is the only one, this is the only one of the four concentration units we're learning today where it's not per the amount of solution. It's per the amount of solvent. So it's make sure you understand that. The second thing is it's per the mass of the solvent. Why would they be doing that? Here's the reason, okay? As you're uh, walking down the sidewalk on your street, if you notice every four to five feet, the sidewalk has a groove cut in it. Do you know why the sidewalk has grooves cut in it? Because the sidewalks are made of concrete and when concrete heats up, it expands. So when summertime comes and gets really, really hot and the concrete starts to expand, it expands into those little open grooves and then at nighttime, it contracts back. You know what happened if the sidewalks around your house didn't have any grooves cut in it? In the summer, the sidewalks would expand and they would buckle and they would all crack. So that's to allow for the fact that substances expand when they're heated. And that's not only true for solids, that's true for liquids. If we go back to the last solution we just talked about, a 250 milliliter solution that's 0 0.200 molar in potassium nitrate, if you can picture a, a volumetric flask and a little meniscus sitting right on the 250 milliliter mark in that flask, the volume of that solution exactly 250. What if we take that solution and we put it on a hot plate and we warm it up to 30 degrees to 40 degrees, not enough to boil it, 
but just to heat it up above room temperature. What you're going to see if you look at the meniscus really closely is the meniscus is going to start to go up because the water is going to expand when it's heated. And as soon as that meniscus goes up above the line, that means the volume in the solution is now 251 milliliters or 252. Uh, whatever it is, it's not 250, it's more than that. So you know what the molarity of the solution is now? I don't know either. Nobody knows. So molarity, unfortunately, is a concentration unit that will change if the temperature changes. That's why if we're ever dealing with molarities, we always assume that the solution is going to maintain itself at room temperature all the time, 20 degrees Celsius to 25 in that range. But what if you're doing experiments where a solution has to be heated up to a high temperature or cooled down to a low temperature? Well, if you need to know its concentration during this entire uh, experiment, a molarity would change. So that's not a very good concentration unit to use when you're varying the temperature. We needed a new concentration unit that's not dependent on volume, which changes with temperature, but maybe something per mass, which doesn't change with temperature. So molality is used because it's a concentration unit that allows you to calculate the moles of a solute, but it does not change when the temperature changes. If you have a kilogram of water as the solvent in a solution and you heat it up, that water still weighs a kilogram. The mass doesn't change, it's only the volume changes. That's why molality is an important unit. We'll see that as we progress throughout this unit as well. So algebraically expressed, molality is moles of solute per kilogram of solvent. So if we do one example to try to calculate molality, we're gonna find the molality of a solution with 11.8 grams of glucose dissolved in 150.0 grams of water. Glucose is C6H12O6. And then to prevent you from having to spend a lot of time going to the periodic table to look up its molar mass, quite often I'll give you the molar mass in these problems. Uh, and lowercase m actually stands for mass, but when you put a bar over it in chemistry, that stands for per mole. So m with a bar over it means the mass per mole. And we have a name for that, that's called molar mass. So when you see that symbol, that means the molar mass of glucose. So if we want to calculate the molality, we need to calculate the moles of the solute. So we'll take the 11.8 grams of glucose and we'll multiply by its molar mass as a conversion factor fraction such that the grams will cancel out. So we'll put those grams on the bottom and the mole goes on the top. Grams cancel out. Number of moles to three significant figures will be 0 0.0. That doesn't count. 655 and then a guard digit 0. We want to divide it now by the kilograms of only the solvent. So I'm not going to add 11.8 and 150. I don't want kilograms of the solution. I want kilograms of only the solvent. So the water's been weighed out. It's 150 grams. And in your head, you can convert grams to kilograms by just dividing by 1,000 or moving the decimal point three places to the left. That becomes 0 0.1500 kilograms. So when you divide this, this fraction is the molality. And we get an answer of 0.437. The actual units are moles of uh, sucrose per kilogram of water, but if you want to abbreviate all that, you can write the italicized M, and it's read as molal, so you would say 0.437 molal C6H12O6. I think it was probably invented by a southern chemist. But those are the four concentration units I'm going to want you uh, to be able to use.